All right. Ugh, I have my mic. Yes, I do. Hello. <laughs> I, had, I forgot if I like actually had a a mic attached to me. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome in um, to the stream today. Oh, who do I see in chat? I see Drew. Welcome in. Um, so welcome into the stream today. We're going to be talking about proportion as a as the principle of design. So not just like you know, um. What's it called? We're not going to just be talking about human proportion because we're going to talk just a smidge about that. Um, but we're not going to be doing any kind of like step by step for that. We're going to be talking about proportion in terms of it being an, a principle of design. So we'll be kind of going over that, going over how that works together. Um, but yeah, before we get going, let's talk a bit about the studio because you already know that it's probably time for that. So if you did not know, our growing community is filled with tons of art nerds and we art nerds have to stick together. So if you're an art nerd too, be sure to check out the links to our social media in the description below and check out our website for our class offerings where you can get critique, guidance, and encouragement from our instructors because we're not just a YouTube channel, we are an art school too. So if you'd like to support us so we can keep making free content, consider supporting us on Patreon for as little as $2 per month where you can get access to tons of perks like my working files, critique sessions, and a huge discounts on our classes that have a limited amount of spots so be sure to check those out before they are gone all right and hello daria welcome in welcome in though you're always here so <laughs> nothing different um okay let's talk a bit about proportion let's start off with you know the thing we probably should start off with which is what is proportion so what is proportion whoa that was an awful w Sorry if I sound more tired than normal. Um, I definitely was not playing the new Animal Crossing update for a really long time. <laughs> what is proportion? So proportion refers to the relationship between one part of a design and another Another part or the rest, oops, of the design. Compare the sizes, shapes. And quantities. Right, so what is proportion? Oh, wait. Yeah, definitely not. Not playing Animal Crossing. No, no, absolutely not. <laughs> um, so what is proportion? Proportion refers to the relationship between one part of a design and another part or the rest of the design. And it is used to compare sizes, shapes, and quantities. All right, so basically what proportion is, is, that is it's an extension of balance. So how proportionate things are to one another can change apparent size or balance. So it isn't always about human anatomy, but that is a part of it. All right, so proportion does not equal only anatomy. Hello, Lewis. Welcome in. In good proportion, creates harmony. We talked about harmony before when we talked about balance. Right, so proportion is not only anatomy. A lot of people, when they hear proportions, they think, oh, we're going to learn about human anatomy. Not necessarily. We are going to go over it just a little bit, but that isn't all that proportion is. And good proportion tends to create harmony, which is a, an extension of balance. 
So when we think about proportion, we are technically figuring out how to work with balance and harmony. So it is almost an extension of that, but it's just different enough to the point where <laughs> where we, we can make, turn it into a different thing. So I'm going to preface by saying it's uh, it's a little tough to teach proportion uh, since you need it with every element of art. It's not a thing that I can split up and go like, oh, this is how you use it with this element. This is how you use it with this element because um, you need it with every element of art and the use of proportion is about the same across every element of art, right? So what we're going to focus on instead today is how to create good proportion within design instead, right? So I'm going to tell you a few steps that you can take or a few things to keep in mind when you're working with proportion and how to include that in your work as a whole. Because just focusing on, because I know we focus on a lot of like single elements when we do these, um, but the thing is, is that it's it's mostly the same <laughs> across every single one. So we're going to instead split it up into things to think about. So number one thing to think about, or the number one thing that you should probably do, right, is to place... similar things together as like, you know, easiest way to call it, which is called, this is called similarity and proximity. within just alt theory things that are similar to one another should be grouped for good portion but can be played with So number one thing that you want to think about when you're doing, when you're thinking about proportion within your artwork, the first thing that you probably want to think of is to place similar things together. So this is called similarity and proximity within gestalt theory. We're not going to talk about gestalt theory. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I just thought I'd bring it up. Um, so similarity within gestalt theory is that things that are similar will automatically be grouped together. And proximity is that things that, oh my God, things that are uh, proximity is things that are closer to each other are automatically group together. So if we kind of blend two of those, that creates good proportion within a piece. So things that are similar to one another should be grouped for good proportion, but this can be played with. So you don't necessarily have to do this. Things that are similar don't always end up together within a piece. Sometimes they're completely separate. Um, but then with if you do something like that, then usually they follow something like compositional techniques, like the rule of thirds, the golden spiral, something like that. Um, so you don't necessarily have to place them close together, but usually it helps. So the thing we're going to be looking at for that portion, um, we're going to be going ancient art again. We're actually going to be going, it starts super old and then it gets newer. So this is the mosaic of Theodora from 547. This is, that's the year that it was made. We don't know the artist. <laughs> um, so it's the year 547, I believe, before Common Era. Um, it's either before Common Era or after Five point five hundred forty-seven. Um, this is from the Byz Byzantine area. <laughs> um, the Byzantine area. So it is um, ancient. Uh, oh, my professor is so mad at me right now. <laughs> anyway, it's the Byzantine era. Era. So it is like older artwork. Um, so the interesting thing about this one is that with a lot of ancient artwork, when you study a lot of it, um, it is it often has the more important figures grouped together. So more often than not, when you look at um, ancient art, 
that more often than not art was used to show off figures of importance. It was like a status symbol if you had art made of you. So when you look at ancient art just like this one, um, if you find the focal point of the piece, that is going to most likely the person who is the most important within the piece. And as you start to radiate outwards, they get less and less important. So obviously, if we look at this one, the mosaic of Theodora, right, she um, is the most important figure in the piece. And as you continue to go outwards, the people slowly get less and less important. But we have our most important figures grouped together and as the focal point. Not only the figures, right, those general elements, but we also have certain color, right? We have these really bright blues and greens that are somewhat um, focused around here, this dark or this dark red, which is like only present within here, which is grouped together again to bring our eyes towards Theodora in the center. And that creates a certain type of emphasis within proportion that we want to look at. Um, so the use of similarity within proportion has evolved around the years as art has evolved as well. So uh, as an overall composition in terms of this piece, um, it appears fairly static. So it's not super, super interesting, but um, the use of proportion and grouping is still something we can use as an example. So it kind of helps us understand the, the term, but um, a piece like this you wouldn't see very often nowadays because we have different artistic um, evolution. We as in artistic society have changed. All right, so that's kind of number one. This is going to go a lot faster than usual because these kind of notes are not as long as usual. So number two is to create proportional or yeah, create proportionate focal points. This should be look closer to a D. Create proportion of focal points. If all sections of a design are equal. it becomes monotonous or boring. Really quickly, focal points. should take out a space compared to what surrounds them. However, ratio is to similar or too large, it'll feel unbalanced. So you need to create proportionate focal points. That's number two. So if all sections of a design are equal, it becomes monotonous or very, very boring really quickly. If you have, if your art piece is literally like, if you think of a checkerboard, right? It's pleasing, it's satisfying, but as an art piece, it gets really boring because it's the exact same square over and over with the exact same ratio and the exact, same, you know, looking at that is not that interesting, right? You could say that, you know, um, Right, you could say that it's satisfying. You could say that it's like um, interesting in terms of perhaps like architectural design, but in terms of if we are thinking of illustration or if we are thinking of more um, interesting stuff like that, right? Um, sorry, not to say that architecture is interesting, <laughs> um, but if we um, were to think of like more modern art, 
right? We don't want things to be super equal or super symmetrical because it gets boring really quickly. We talked about kind of the same thing with balance, but you know, stuff like that. Uh, focal points should take up less space compared to what surrounds them. When you have a focal point, notice that usually it takes up a lot less space compared to what's surrounding them, right? Most of the time when you have a focal point, the focal point will be a smaller area because that smaller area will be somewhere where our eyes lead to. It's like, it's because our eyes are always drawn to what there's less of. So when we have a focal point, most of the time we want it to take up less space compared to what surrounds them. However, if the ratio is too similar or too large, it'll feel unbalanced. So if we have a ratio of, let's say like half of the pieces, it's like 50, 50, or like maybe it's like 60, 40, if we think of it that way, right? If it takes up that much from like focal point to background per se, right? If it takes up a very similar amount of space, um, then it becomes very boring as well. It's like, it feels unbalanced. It feels like it's not a focal point. It's just half the piece. Or if it's too large, if your focal point is way too tiny and everything else is super, super large, then it also feels unbalanced because then you're leaving too much negative space in there. So you got to be kind of balanced with it. How's everyone's Friday been? I've been playing so many video games. I just... <laughs> I need to do work, but I've been like, I've remembered that I had, well, like, obviously, I, it's not like I remembered, but I, I, I realized I had the Nintendo Switch Online account, so, like, I could play, like, classic Nintendo games as well, because I have access to the um, SNES library. So, not only have I been playing Animal Crossing, but I've been playing, like, old Kirby games as well. So, I was playing Kirby Superstar, like, the original from the 90s. And then I was playing Kirby's Dream Land 3, which also came out, I think, in the 90s. And I'm like, <laughs> I was like, I haven't played these. Let's go. It's time to play stuff that I haven't played with Kirby. Um, I am on the verge of getting the upgrade, like the Nintendo Switch Online upgrade, just so I can play Kirby and the Crystal Shards and um, Ocarina of Time. Because the N64 kind of era of... Uh, in terms of game art, I love. Um, it's like it's like those low poly kind of. I love that aesthetic so much. It's just so fun. Jesse B gaming. Literally, I haven't played video games in so long. This is like, ugh, freedom. Anyway, all right. Oh, whoops. Next part number three is don't arrange. Oh, wait, my bad. I didn't even give the example. Buffoon. So create proportion of focal points. This is like one of my favorite ones too. This example is called The Dentist. Uh, the Dentist by Gerard van Pomphorst. I'm probably pronouncing that incorrectly. I apologize, but I am not great with Dutch, nor am I Dutch at all. So The Dentist by Gerard van Pomphorst, which was painted in 1622. Um, so this was from the Baroque era. Oh, hi from Italy. This is literally perfect guide for me right now. Finally, Medibang works on my PC. Fantastic, Lone Wolf. I'm glad that it is a great time. And I'm glad that Medibang works for you again. Me too. Like, I was, like, getting nervous doing Photoshop every week. Um, even though I use Photoshop most of the time. Um, but yeah. Hello from Italy and hello from Canada on my end. <laughs> um... Yes, so this is a dentist by John von Hornhorst. Um, this piece was painted in 1622, which is the Baroque era, era, the Baroque era. I'm a very big fan of Baroque, the Baroque period paintings. Um, it's kind of like a slightly more religious era, but Baroque is known for using very, very heavy contrast. I'm a really heavy, I'm a really big fan of heavy contrast. So like really heavy darks and really bright lights. Um, I love that like super stark contrast. So I love, um, Hot Horse, I love Caravaggio, I love Rembrandt, I love all that fun jazz, um, because it has that really, so I'm geeking out about Baroque. I love that, I love that kind of, like, um, very hyper-realistic look with that really heavy lighting. It's one of my favorite things ever. It's making me scared and I don't get scared of the dentist. Yeah, the thing with, um, uh, all kind of Baroque art is it's very expressive. So if Baroque art is very expressive and um, quite dark sometimes. It's a great, it's a great period. Um, I don't know much about it. I just like the aesthetics of it and the very technical aspects of it. Yeah, you too, Chloe. Yes, Baroque is one of the favorite art movies, me too. 
Um, I love Baroque, and ironically, I love Dadism. Those are the two that I really love. Dadism is surrealism. Those three, oh, the best to look at. Anyway, <laughs> um, so proportion is used within lighting in the figures within this piece. If we kind of um, refer back to where I was talking about originally, right, create proportionate focal points. Um, with this one, it utilizes lighting, lighting and color, to create those proportionate focal points. So obviously our main focal point is right here, it's the tiniest source of light um, on the piece, but it is the brightest source of light as well. What's happening is there's a candle right here and it's reflecting directly onto uh, this man's face. So what's happening here is that it's a slowly fading area of effect due to the lighting, right? We have the super, super tiny area. The light continues to reflect off of other people. So really, if we were to think about what the actual focal point is, it's something, it's kind of like that, right? Our focal point is more like that compared to just this. Even though this is where we go first, that really, really tiny area of effect, this right here, this whole kind of general area is our focal point, truly. So even though the area of effect is quite small, which if it was only this compared to like everything else that's dark, that's very disproportionate, right? That's a very, very disproportionate piece. But because of the slowly fading light, it expands the proportional area. It, yeah, it expands the proportional area. So it's not just the single area, it's that much larger area of effect. Like if we were to make it more of like a proper oval, it's like that, which is proportionate compared to the rest of the era, area around it. So what it does is it draws your eyes here first and then slowly your eyes kind of radiate outwards as if it's a spiral, like radial balance almost. This isn't quite radial balance, but what it does is it, it does a really good job of leading lines, kind of getting you to look around the canvas starting from here. Even though we're not talking about balance or lines or leading lines or anything like that. All right, number three, what we want to think about so if you make the small thing brighter, you focus on the small thing, kind of. If you make the small thing just less than everything else, that's your focal point. You can have a very bright composition and then one dark thing in there, and the dark thing will pop out, right? You just, really what it is, this is contrast. We talked about contrast first, I believe. Um, but really what it is is opposites. You need to have um, a mix of contrast, proportion, and balance in order to get a really good focal point. Okay. Really, it's hard to know how to do any of these perfectly without knowing them all first. So that's why we're doing them one at a time, and then we'll kind of go back to each one after a time. So number three is don't arrange mathematically. This one is kind of hard to understand unless if I explain it. <laughs> So it's just a TLDR, it's avoid math at all costs. <laughs> um, but let me explain that a little bit more. So perfect fractions. So like one half, oops, one third and one fourth, etc. can be very well not monotonous as well usually better to feel around and get a sense of what you whoops you want rather oops rather than worry about perfection. I'm writing, in perf I'm writing in full sentences this time just because 
proportion is a bit weirder to follow. <laughs> so it's more dynamic. When it's not exact. Right, so don't arrange your elements mathematically. Don't arrange your elements mathematically. So when we think of that, right, um, perfect fractions within your artwork, I kind of mentioned it earlier, perfect fractions, so a half, a third, a quarter, etc., can be very monotonous because it's it's too exact. It's too, like, calculated. It's too intense in that, direct, in that way, right? And it usually feels better to, it usually looks better, feels better to feel around and get a sense of what you want rather than worry about perfection. Sometimes when we're working, you know, we get caught up in like, oh my gosh, it's not exactly a half. Or like, oh my God, it's not exactly like a quarter of the piece. Don't do that. It's, <laughs> it, you know, it's a very mathematical way of looking at it. And what that creates is a very, very monotonous kind of boring design or very boring kind of composition. Um, so it's usually more dynamic when it's not exact, right? If I were to look back at the dentist piece again, I don't know. What is this? If I, <laughs> this area of effect, what is this? Is a third quarter? I don't know. I don't know. But guess what? It looks fine. <laughs> right? We don't know. If I was to like perfectly split it so it's like, hmm, it's an exact size, like an exact half kind of thing, it would it'd feel super boring. It'd feel like super monotonous. Right? So we want to make sure that we have that nice, um, well, balance <laughs> that we learned about last week. But, you know, when we have our proportions, we want to make sure that it's not exact either. So let me pull out our last kind of historical piece, which is, oh, I need to make this thing longer. No, I don't. No, I don't. It's fine. There's only one left. I'm just gonna, oh, you know what? Let's just do that. There we go. So we can have the white background. So this piece is Fruit on a Tablecloth with a Fruit Dish by Georges Brock, uh, painted in 1925 during the Cubist era. Cubist era, right? So that's like most people know Picasso from the Cubist era. George Brock was another kind of leading figure within the Cubist era. Um, if you don't know what Cubism is, um... <laughs> Sorry, I was going to make a joke like, what are you doing? You live under a rock. Not everybody knows what Cubism is. Um, but usually the Cubist era... Uh, the cubist area is, is the one where they experimented with not using correct proportions at all um, and they focused on using geometric shapes to show off objects and um, mess around with it was as if you were looking through a broken mirror broken glass right so that's kind of what they wanted to experiment with with cubism um so though this piece is really geometric right even though it's super geometric there really isn't any math here there's no math, right? There's a lot of squares, there's a lot of trapezoids, a lot of really harsh geometry, but there isn't any math here, right? It's an approximation of the rule of thirds, right? It's approximately on the rule of thirds. It's approximately, right? Our eyes kind of go here first, right? So the fruit bowl, obviously, there's more detail within this area. There's also the lightest values within this area, right? So it's an approximation of the rule of thirds. It's an approximation of the elements and an approximation of color. It's an approximation. Like it's like it's not like you don't see any perfect ratios, despite all that geometry. You don't see any perfect ratios. You don't see any perfect halves or quarters or anything like that. It just kind of works. <laughs> you look at it and you're like, yeah, that seems about right, <laughs> right. So don't focus so heavily on exacts in terms of proportion, or else the piece will feel very boring. All right. This is a little bit more interesting to look at. We got a bunch of textures on here. We got a bunch of different shapes. And it's just, it's, it's better to look at. It just feels more interesting to look at. All right. Okay. Final. Oops. That's right. I turned this off. Final piece or final thing that we're going to talk about. This is the last kind of point I wanted to make. Oh, this is good time. This is going to be a, the, our, our piece for today. Like our, our piece that's going to like be an example for this is, is a big one today. So I want to get it moving. <laughs> So number four is create harmony. We've talked about harmony already. Harmony and unity. Harmony is kind of like the extension of unity where things feel like they fit together and like it feels harmonious. It feels like you can move throughout the piece and it feels like, it feels like as if you're listening to a song. That's why they have a lot of, um, they use a lot of musical <laughs> musical terms when it comes to the principles of design because they work the same, right? Create harmony where it's a bunch of different elements that still feel like they fit smoothly together. That's what harmony pretty much is. 
So quote unquote, make things. fit together. And the example that we should use for this one is, you know, human anatomy. However, this doesn't need to feel Realistic. Just needs work. Needs to work within within the style. They've been given. Oop, given. So IE, or example, or it's called exaggeration. Right, so number four is create harmony. It makes things, make things fit together. <laughs> make things feel like they work together, right? So like, for example, we have human anatomy. When you draw a person that's more realistic, you can tell when a head is too big on the body. You can tell when a head is too small, right? The hands, you can tell when they're too big, too small, right? It doesn't need to feel realistic, however, right? When you look at something, it, it doesn't necessarily need to feel realistic. It just needs to work within the art style they've been given. What that means is think of, actually, you know what? I'm going to talk about that when we get to our examples, right? So it doesn't need to feel realistic. It just needs to work within the style they've been given. So that is called exaggeration. Right, the scale of exaggeration depends on the style. So our final example, examples, for this last bit, number four, we're going to do something a little different. So that means I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to use two examples. So we're going to have two examples for this last one because I want to compare and contrast them. All right, of course it's modern artwork or modern things. So we're going to compare two shows. We're going to compare Adventure Time to the Avatar, right? The thing with this is because they have two very, they're both cartoons, right? They're both more cartoony, um, but they have very, they have two very, very different art styles. Right? We look at the two, right? Avatar leans more on the side of realism. Even though it's not realistic, it still leans closer to realism than Avatar does, or than uh, Adventure Time does, right? Some people could argue that Avatar is quote unquote more correct than Adventure Time's in terms of proportional anatomy. Right. Some people would, would say like, oh yeah, it's like Avatar is more correct. You're wrong. I'm just, I'm just going to say it flat out. You're wrong. <laughs> right. That's not necessarily true. Proportions are all about relativity and set rule sets. So Adventure Time's proportions are correct. They just use different measurements. They use different proportional techniques. Right. However, those measurements are consistent and accurate throughout each character, meaning they're proportional within the style. Right? Every art style has a different rule set. Can you get things wrong? Absolutely. The thing with proportion is that it's based on relativity. Right? It's based on relativity. It's not about what the initial numbers are. It's how you can change those numbers over time. Right? If we were to take Adventure Time, let's look at the characters. Right? A lot of times we measure people in heads. I should use black. What has the most contrast? Okay. Let's use red then. So when we look at head heights, right, we, when we think of heads and measuring people, heads are what we use in terms of relativity in order to measure out a character, right? If this is about, I don't remember how old Princess Bubblegum is. I think she's like a late teenager, early adult by the end. Um, what time is it? Uh, in Canada, it's 4.34 <laughs> p.m. All right, so if we took her own head height, right, we kind of multiplied that to see what the whole thing is, right? She's about five heads tall, which is about the, if we took very realistic proportions, that's about how tall a child would be. That's child measurements. However, her as a young adult or a mid teenager, that's not really, um, that's not correct in terms of realism, but it works within this proportional style because it repeats itself within other characters. For instance, uh, Flame Princess, she's a little bit shorter, but her head height, I, if I had to estimate, is about four and a half to five heads. 
Hello, Speed Squeezer. Welcome in. And don't worry if you're late. It's always like, you know, you can watch it back. Marceline is about the same head height as well, about five heads, right? So it stays consistent throughout everybody within the show. Finn is a bit younger. His head height is about, if I had to estimate, about four, four to four and a half heads, right? If we look throughout his whole body. Let's actually do it. So it's one, two, three, four. Yeah, about four and a half to four and two thirds, right? So he's a little bit younger than Princess Bubblegum, so that makes sense, right? We have a slightly smaller proportion in terms of the characters themselves, right? So not incorrect. They're not incorrect proportions. It's just different rule sets. She's about a million years. I've seen this show too much. Okay, well, whatever. She's meant to, like, kind of appear as, like, a young teenager, if I remember correctly, because there was that whole arc where Finn liked her. And was like, I remember that much. I don't remember much else, because I've only watched one season. <laughs> Avatar, on the other hand, uses far more realistic proportions in terms of their body anatomy. Uh, if we took Katara back here, I believe that's her name. I haven't watched Avatar. If we took kind of Katara over here, I believe she's meant to be, like, a... Oops. Oops. Right, if we kind of took this. So she's approximately five and a half-ish heads, because this right down here is where it ends off. That's technically where it stops. She sees approximately about high, five and a half heads. Same as um same as Adventure Time. However, Katara's a child right? That's a little bit more realistic in terms of realistic anatomy. Children are usually about five and a half ish heads, depending on how old they are, right? If they're about, if they're within like maybe um, late single digits, early double digits, that's approximately correct, right? That's about what it is with when it comes to realistic anatomy. Um, however, not the same as, obviously it's not the same as um, Adventure Time, but that's fine, right? This just leans more onto the realistic side. Let's think of our art styles as a big line. A big kind of line, right? If we go from, if this is the scale of um, cartoony, or let's say that this is like exaggerated. No, let's say that this is like pure cartoon. It's a hyper real zone. Depending on where it lands on this scale, right? Let's say that it's a slightly more realistic style. Let's say it's over here. When we work with that slightly more realistic style, we expect it to look more real in terms of proportions, right? That's why, say, if we have a sty something stylized like, like a manga, a lot of the times anime and manga use more realistic proportions. If we see a manga character who has hands that are too big, <laughs> a torso that's too long, right? It feels incorrect because it doesn't match the style that it's been given. If we have a style that looks like Adventure Time, if it leans more to pure cartoon and we see very realistic proportions, that feels off because then it's like, whoa, 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 you have this super cartoony style. Why are you using such realistic proportions? That feels a bit off, right? So depending on the style that you've been given, you need to work proportionally with there. When you're working in the more cartoony area, you need to make sure that you're setting your own rule set within that style. Um, so adults should be about consistent. They should be approximately consistent within their head heights, right? Children should be approximately consistent within their head heights, right? So it all depends on the style that you want to give it. So comparing these two, saying like, oh, Adventure Time is so ugly compared to Avatar. That's not, It's it doesn't work that way, <laughs> right? Say if you were to compare Avatar to... Voltron Legendary Defender, right? If we were to compare those two, that feels more um, fair because they are, you know, approximately the same art style. They're approximately working within the same kind of exaggerated tone where the exaggeration is mostly within facial structure, not within body structure. Um, so you could compare those two easy, same as how you could compare Adventure Time to, let's say, like something like Gravity Falls, where they have that same kind of like Gravity Falls, if I had to estimate their head height for children, it's about like three and a half heads, right? If I was to really, really just guesstimate, right? So it's approximately the same sort of proportions. You can argue which one's better, which one isn't. Um, but overall, um, TLDR art styles are tough. Anyway. <laughs> 
So that's going to be our lesson sort of portion for today. Where would you say your style falls under? Me? Um, depends on what genre I'm working in. <laughs> um, I like to shift my style depending on what genre I'm going in, just because I like to... Like, overall, my style falls light on the slightly more realistic side in terms of proportion, uh, just because I like to keep very realistic proportions with my characters. However, I like to use um, more non-realistic proportions within facial structure. Um, so within body proportion, it has that exaggeration, but more so within um, muscle definition compared to head height and proportional uh, measurement. Um, but, like, if I'm working in... I can't talk about that. <laughs> um, there is a genre that I work in where I work very cartoony in terms of like my head heights shift, my body proportions shift, all that fun jazz where when I work in that style, adult height, average adult height, head height is usually around six to six and a half heads, which is pretty small for an adult. Um, within my general work, like Grayson, that is, um, a little bit shifted proportionally in terms of head heights, but I do like to keep that like seven heads for adults mostly. Um, horror, I like to keep very hyper-realistic. If I'm working with more, um, serious horror, then I do like to work in more hyper-realistic way. Um, so painting, keep those head heights exactly the same, keep those proportions exactly the same, because I feel it looks a little more eerie. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a range, right? It's good to know how to do both, because when you know how to do it all, then you know how, um, then it kind of helps empower the other, right? It's good to know realism, and it's good to know cartooning. It's good to know both to appreciate both, A, and B, it's good to know both to um, be a bit more versatile and be a bit more strong with your own artwork. I meant that, that first one's very important, to be able to appreciate both styles, because people who work exclusively in one tend to be a bit more bitter about the other. <laughs> so you know realists are like oh cartoons are so easy and cartoonists are like oh realism it's so boring right it's you know i love hyper realism and i love heavy cartooning right i love them both and i love them for different reasons all right so again that's kind of our lesson for today so what we're going to be doing today like all of our elements of art Let's actually make this six. Uh, let's make this seven thousand. Let's make it. Ooh, let's make this seven thousand. Let's make it long. Yeah. So just like our other elements of um principles of design streams, we're gonna be doing a Kirby piece for the final one. Um, this Kirby piece, right? We're when we're working with proportion. Um, I love working with exaggerated proportion. Um, but proportion is also in relativity to backgrounds. We talked a lot, of, pretty heavily, with people. Um, people and color and just general elements, but we haven't really talked about um, extreme proportion in terms of having um, intense epic style or intense epic size, which is something that a lot of concept artists do. Um, so that's mostly what I wanted to talk about today um, is to have that, re or to do today, to have that really fantastical looking size. I'm going to zoom out again, super, super far out. Um, because what we're going to be working with today, if you um, have been here for a while, you know that our polls that show up on the channel determine um, what our next piece will be for streams. So this next piece, we decided on um, an abandoned valley, which I'm very excited to work with. I'm going to try to work with flat illustration, just to mess around a little bit. But what I really want to do is I want to kind of go with a sort of like valley with a canyon. I want to work with big heavy like um big heavy like exaggerated scale and like no medibang don't do this to me Ugh, really okay being a bit annoying there um I want to work with, like, aerial perspective. I want to work with, you know, all that fun jazz. So I'm kind of thinking of, like, a giant valley with, like, leftover stones. And What is up with Nightbang? You don't want to work today? It doesn't even let me flip my pen. It doesn't even recognize it. Is it because I'm zoomed out too far? Hello, fancy dinosaur. Welcome in. 
Lance really doesn't like that. Yeah, what's up with that? It doesn't let me. Okay, if it gets really tough, we'll switch to Photoshop again. <laughs> So this time around, I'm going to have Kirby pretty small. I'm going to break a rule or two when I was talking during my, during proportions, because the thing with proportional size, with your focal points, Kirby's our focal point. The thing with proportional size and focal points is that, oh my God. Yeah. It doesn't recognize the back of my pen. That's super annoying. Um, the thing with proportional size is that it needs to work in multiple ways. Okay, how am I going to do this? I have like a vision in my head and I'm not doing it correctly. <laughs> Let's put on a grid. Let's see if that helps because I have a very low... Grids, like perspective grids, they don't have to be super accurate, but what they can do is they can really help um, bring a scene together. Just give you a good idea of what the perspective is that you want to work with. It gives you a good idea of like... where elements should be. So what I kind of want to do is I want to create like an abandoned valley as if there was like an old, oh, my eraser works again, fantastic. Um, as if there was like an old society that lived here. And these are giant, like, votive figure statues. And Kirby's just down here. Exploring a little bit. That's what I'm kind of vibing with here. So, this is working with really giant size. Hello, Varapasad. Welcome in. So Kirby's down here. Again, very approximate rule of thirds. He's not really 100% on the rule of thirds, but it's approximate enough where it still feels okay. So I'm thinking like these are just giant statues lost to time. If it's an abandoned valley. Yeah. Okay. But the thing with this one is I'm going to be working, I think I'm actually going to work with a lot of layers for this one. Because, oops. I want to kind of go for a very concept arty kind of vibe when it comes to this. Oof. Don't like that, do you? The G pen doesn't like it when I work very large with it. That's unfortunate and very annoying. <laughs> I'm going to work with a very greenish palette. I'm going to try to get the colors that I want from just pure color picking. I'm going to try not to. use too many layer styles. <laughs> Hello, Emma. Welcome in. Just using a lot of layers is a rare sight to see. Yes, it is. So this is a 
Um, within concept art, this is called a non-destructive way of working. When you have a lot of different layers, you have a lot of organization, this is very non-destructive. Because it's a, it's a way where you can, you know, work and like not have to worry about messing up too much. Actually, oh no, that's right. If I should be a little bit more label. Hello, Kirby, welcome in. I'm gonna have to, oops. I'm gonna have to work with a very, um, I don't know what I was going to say. I'm sorry. I just <laughs> I started talking and I completely forgot what I was saying. Oh my god. What is up with you today, Medibank? But again, I'm kind of working in a very flat kind of look. So I'm working with a very light... I should have done the... Like, sky first, so then I can approximate color from there he used non-destructive a lot yeah most good concept artists do <laughs> the thing is is that i i don't like non-destructive just because it takes up a lot of file size like a lot of file space i hate that i always sacrifice um a piece into being destructive for file size i can't stand huge file sizes Sorry, I'm kind of I'm focusing just a smidge, to, a smidge, smidge harder today, just because there's a certain look that I really want from this one. Listen, Jeepen, I know you don't like it when I use you like this, but you're gonna have to work with me today. It really doesn't like it. Like, it hates it when I use it with big sizes. That's so annoying. <laughs> Let me use large sizes, please. Hello, Sucktunus. Welcome in. When I'm done, I always merge the layers so it doesn't create a massive file. See, I can't do that because I always have my original because sometimes I go back into the file, right? Like, I'll save it as a JPEG afterwards which helps for sure. But like, if I actually want to go back in and like edit the layers, which I do a lot of the times, like I can't merge them all as a final thing or else it'll mess it up. I hate merging too. Like merging layers like scares me because then it's like, oh my God, I'm losing the original bits. It's hard to do what I want to do with this kind of brush. <laughs> it's just not the, the brush size or the brush shape that I want with the what I have in my brain. Actually, let's do it this way. What I'm doing right now is this is called um, atmospheric perspective. And what that is, is it's just your... Um, your elements like becoming more blue or fading into the distance as it gets farther away. As I mentioned, Medibang does not like working with this brush. Nor does it like it when I try to make things larger. Because <laughs> it always lags. Look at that. That's so annoying. It's like, it's so like obvious to you. Listen, Medibang is great, but it doesn't like big file sizes like this. I have a pretty, I have a fairly powerful computer. So it's like, it, 
when it handles like this, it's like, oh. <laughs> Josie, weren't you really showing me that two weeks ago sometimes it's best to just move on and not spend too much time on a piece? Oh, absolutely. But I've only spent like 30 minutes on this piece. That's not enough time. <laughs> I'm talking about like if you've been working on a piece for like, if you've been working on a single area for like a whole hour, then you need to move on, right? If you've been working on it and nothing is changing, then you got to move on. If you've only spent 10 to 15 minutes on a piece and immediately give up, there's something wrong with that. <laughs> That's just a lack of persistence, right? You need persistence to work with it, right? Um, but if you've been working for ages on a single piece and you're getting nowhere, then you're going to want to move on. But if you've just been spending like 15 minutes max on something, that's not enough time. <laughs> 15 minutes, half an hour, that's not enough time. If it's a single area, sure. But... You know, you want to get it as close as you can to what your vision is. You shouldn't focus on super, super tiny things. But you do want to push and pull as much as you can. Yeah. I may actually, I may get all these values down. And I might actually... switch to photoshop i might just to like because it is getting a little bit annoying that's what this layer is right yes having some apple pie love that love that But yeah, merging is technically the way you're supposed to do it. Like, you don't... <laughs> you're supposed to merge and kind of move on, you know? Just background. Kirby's invisible right now. Yeah, I'm going to do Kirby last. Um, just because I want to get these values in. Kirby is going to be... This is a this is going to be a triadic palette. Um, so Kirby is going to be a very... A very heavy kind of contrast to what we're looking at right now. Um, so I'm working on him last just because... Does that feel a bit better? Not really. Because it's not letting me blend properly. You can do anything with any material, but if your material stops working, then it gets a bit tough. <laughs> you can work with anything, but don't expect to get too far if you're trying to paint with a dry palette, you know? So I'll see when I'm, I'll see what my ratio or what my tolerance is for throwing in the towel and switching programs. <laughs> If I ever go quiet, I'm kind of trying to finesse this a little bit more. Yeah, because I'm thinking of a really kind of bright valley. Has Manybang ever randomly deleted one of your drawings? Mine does. It gets very annoying when I spend five hours on something. Nope. Never had that happen to me. If you save on the cloud, that probably happens because it might be trying to free up space. I save directly onto my computer. So they're like hard files that like are saved directly there. So I don't have that issue. <laughs> We're learning more than art lessons today. Gotta learn patience and perseverance, basically. I always tell people whenever, whenever I like, whenever students pop in, like, 
when I'm actually teaching students, a big, le- like a thing that always pops up, that tends to pop up, um, is we talk about careers. We talk about art and careers, right? I tell them there's a difference between wanting to be a hobbyist and like actually choosing art as a career, right? Being a hobbyist, totally okay, right? If you just want to do this as a hobby, you just kind of want to have fun with it, right? Not make it into a career, totally cool, right? Hobbyists are like the most free form of artists because they don't care, <laughs> right? They're not doing it for money. They're not really doing, they're doing it for enjoyment. It's a hobby. So they don't really care if their work is perfect. They don't really care if their work is proportionally accurate. They don't really care about all that jazz, right? They can just do whatever they want. And guess what? That's totally fine, right? If that's not what the area of expertise that they want is, totally fine. Stick with it. I've had a few students who just love art and they want to do it hobby, like in a hobby way, but they wanted to learn a little bit extra, right? Totally cool. I respect that. I like, you know what? Great. Great for you. Um, but I warn the people, especially the people who are like, I want to become an animator, right? I warn those people because you know, art will, will suck your soul out of your body. (laughs) It's like, it really will. As a professional artist, I can say art will suck your soul out of your body. It is soul crushing. If you're not prepared for that, you're not prepared for the, like, if you, if you don't understand that, then like, you're not prepared for the industry. Like you can, you can build up to it. If you're still young, you can build up to it. You can learn about it. You can get better at getting better with that. But it's, it's a tough reality that you have to like figure out for yourself. And like, if you don't think you can handle that, then you you might not. And that's fine, right? Some people I've seen, like, they, they, they get into art and then they realize, wow, this is tough, right? I don't want to do it. It's, it's rough. And you know what? That's okay, too. That's totally okay. It's all, it's like, it's up to you, right? It's your career. It's what you want as an artist. And if you find that you can't handle art, that's okay. It's tougher than a lot of people think it is. And that's always a con- that's always a conversation that pops up at some point. You know? Because I teach kind of like mid teens, mid to early teens. That's when they kind of start to think about like, yeah, I want to do art as a career. And not everybody does. And that's okay. You know what? Whatever you choose, that's totally fine with me, right? There's a lot of really popular artists online who are like they're marine biologists, they're uh they're lawyers, they're whatever, right? And art's just their hobby. And guess what? They're free. <laughs> They're free. That's why they enjoy what they do so much because they don't care. I don't always save in the cloud. I might save things in the cloud. Yeah, it might be something to do with device storage then if that's the issue. Yeah, I love hobbyists. Sometimes though, hobbyists overstep their grounds and think that they know what and then I'm like, okay, now you need to go. <laughs> it's been a day for you. For some reason I have no school today. I just watched Scooby Doo. That's valid. I woke up and immediately played Animal Crossing. Um, went out for lunch and then worked when I got back home. I'm trying to, I've been trying to, like, push myself as of late, like, in terms of, like, color theory, um, to, like, work without layer styles, because I find that, um, I've been getting too soft. (laughs) I've been relying too much on layer styles as of late, so I've been, like, I I taught a recent lesson with my, um, mentorship students, um, and I didn't, like, I taught about lighting, and I didn't use a single layer style. I used it all just on normal layers, and I tried to match colors, um, based on what I knew about color. Um, I think I did a pretty good job, <laughs> not gonna lie. Um, like obviously layer styles can give you a different sort of accuracy, but, um, I want to keep my, my skill set up basically.
when things get farther away with an aerial perspective, um, what's it called? Their, their values and value difference become a little bit more subtle. So if you're working with an aerial perspective, you want to make sure that the values between objects slowly become less apparent, a little more subtle. Because that creates a nice sort of fading away effect. Like it's really going off into the distance. <laughs> yeah, it does look like a grimace. <laughs> that face kind of looks like a grimace. Very true, very true. Oh, wrong layer. Yeah, it looks like kind of the robot from Nier. The big kind of open eye look is one of my favorite things. I've never played Nier. My best friend loves Nier. I was thinking of kind of like a, a Daruma doll. Like a big kind of like... Kind of like statue like that. Well, they're not big. They're like small little dolls. But that's kind of what my brain is kind of going towards. This should be a little bit lighter. One of the things that I taught uh, my students recently was uh, Chevril's rule of color interaction. And it's like one of my favorite things right now. Um, and it's the idea that base colors will look different depending on what surrounds them. And it's like, it's like, it's a bit of, it's a part of color theory. And it's like one of my favorite things right now. Um, speaking of, I need to get my students feedback soon. Um, but yeah, it's one of my favorite things at the moment. It's just, it's so fun. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's the ground. Which one's this one? Okay. Oh, it's 507. Let's talk about the channel, because we gotta do that. So, if you're new to the channel hello welcome in uh, but if you didn't know we are not just a youtube channel we're also an art studio so if you'd like to check out the classes that we offer be sure to join us on our website check out the classes that we offer winter camp is coming up soon so if you'd like to sign up for any of those i'm teaching some intensives or i'm teaching a week of illustration intensives um so if you'd like to join in with that join in um, with the other classes that we offer, um, because there are more kitty camps compared to the uh, teen intensives that I am teaching. Um, so if you'd like to join in with those, feel free to check them out on our website. Um, this file that you see in front of you, as well as this file with our lesson on it, will both be available on our Discord as JPEGs. So if you'd like to join us on Discord, join in, chat with us. We spent a long time talking about Animal Crossing yesterday. Um, so if you'd like to join in on the Discord, feel free to do so. Come say hi, um, share your artwork, get feedback. But if you'd like the, obviously this file has a bajillion layers. Usually they don't, but this one does. If you'd like to see how I organize these layers, you're going to have to join our Patreon for as little as $5 a month. And over there you have the ability to, you know, check out my working files, see behind the scenes stuff that happens at the studio, you know, check all that fun jazz out. Um, and there are limited amount of spots for class discounts. So if you're interested in those, be sure to check them out before they're gone. Oh, right. Hello, Derek Green. Welcome in. Can I scout you? For what purpose? I don't scout people. <laughs> I too think about Mr. Mosquito Man. Yes, I do. Oh, Mr. Mosquito Man. I didn't realize he'd be a favorite of the channel. <laughs> you can never predict these things. So just kind of, oops, taking some values from 
other areas. Hello, Hercules Antonio. Welcome in. Okay, because this value difference is too similar on this side. So I'll need to lighten this up. Probably give it some rim light. That'll make it a nice kind of harsh sort of difference, perhaps. Face reminds you of Totoro. That's what I was thinking of while I was drawing it. <laughs> I was like, it kind of looks like Totoro. I'm like kind of going for a Ghibli kind of vibe with this one. I love Ghibli. Totoro is actually not one of my favorite Ghiblis. I did like it, of course. I haven't, I've never watched a Ghibli that I didn't like. Um, but Totoro is actually not one of my favorites. I did like it though, but it's one of the few that I've only seen once. If you put it on, I'm not going to say no. I'll watch it with you. <laughs> but it's certainly not like in my top. Like 15, I'd say. I'd say it's more in like my. Or it's not in my top five, I don't think. Yeah, I was thinking a little bit more like Totoro when I was. while I was working with this one. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Let's fix this real quick. I'm actually going to. Can I change the hue of this a little bit? That's another thing I don't really like about Medivang. It's like when I use the hue slider, it's not like progressive. It's all like just one big movement, which is a little bit annoying. Oops. That's the thing you can always guarantee that you're getting from me. If I am, if I don't like something, I will talk about it. <laughs> I will complain. <laughs> it's like you want more, slightly more realistic product reviews. You talk to me. <laughs> Come on. Come. Yeah, it doesn't like when I use huge brushes. It's like the G pen does not like that. Can I use? Because the mapping pen is almost the same as the G pen. It's just like a little bit more complex. Oof, the mapping pen is worse. All right, back to the G pen. <laughs> yeah, because the pen trails off. Another Friday of Jesse shading Medi thing. Only a little bit. All out of- it's all love. I get it. It's an open source program. It's free, right? I can only expect so much, basically. <laughs> I am a snob when it comes to materials. So as much as I'll preach that you can use whatever the heck you want, I am a snob with what I use. <laughs> How would I do this light and shadow effect? Um, my brain. I did. <laughs> um, so really, all I'm doing is I'm figuring out where. Um, what's it called? I'm figuring out where, like you know, um, the light light sources in this case is coming from over here, and I'm kind of adding. Uh, what's it called? I'm adding light and shadows based off of what I think goes in certain areas. So for instance, um, I'm trying to figure out how I'm explaining this because really I'm just doing it off the top of my head. I <laughs> I 
it's color theory. It's all color theory. But really, I'm just taking where my where my light source is, and I'm approximating where everything should go from there. Yeah, it's really just getting an understanding of how your values work. Ugh, I'm gonna have to add ambient occlusion in this. Okay. I was probably gonna do that anyway, but. Should I show the mouth on this one? No. Let's just do the eye, since so like it's kind of turned around. Add motion blur. You mean a Gaussian blur? Motion blur is a bit different. I might. Part of me doesn't want to though. Just because of how large the scale is, a Gaussian blur might not work correctly. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. This Gaussian blur on Medibang is not exactly what I want all the time. For those who are wondering, uh, Soxanus is talking about adding a Gaussian, most likely, is talking about adding a Gaussian blur to change the um, focal point, or the, uh, not focal point, um, focal length, that's right. So it's about changing the focal length. Um, when you have a short focal length, usually there's only a single area of in focus, right? Think of a red box. Think of as if you have a red box. If you have a little camera, if your camera's here, and this is the area that it's shooting. A short focal length, let's say only an area about this big is in focus. Everything else on the outsides and insides, that's all blurry. That creates a Gaussian blur. If it is a long focal length, then let's say that this whole area is all in focus, right? And then you have these kind of tiny areas that are not in focus or that are, yeah, that are blurry, right? So a short focal length usually makes things um, look like they're going farther into the distance. I love short focal length. However, short focal length is usually most apparent on um, smaller compositions so areas where the the area where like the area effect is smaller so usually indoors or um just taking a photo of somebody on the street usually when it's like the main like the main person's right there um or when you're just yeah when you're just photographing a single person you see a lot of short focal length there as well um with big landscapes it's rare that you see a short focal length usually you want to get that full landscape in there so it's rare to see it um but I'll see if it needs it, because like sometimes I'm I'm wrong and I need it. I need to be there. <laughs> Can you see trying to make this horizon effect? Uh what do you mean by that? I'm I'm not hundred percent sure what you mean by the horizon effect. Um, Bri, I remember yesterday that I was trying to take up a piece of pie while I was taking it out. It broke apart. I was so sad. No! <laughs> Ripping pieces. <laughs> Literally. Um. <laughs> Talking about motion blur. If you want to see... Well, first of all, Medibang doesn't have motion blur. Um, filter. Oh, it does have motion blur. Motion blur is like... Here, let me show you the difference. If I was to draw a person here... Even if you're a hobbyist, you should use some of the correct terms. If I use motion blur, say I don't like a little stick figure. Um, filter. Motion blur. Motion blur is like that. If it'll ever load. 
Come on, you can do it. So motion blur is like that. It looks like it's moving from side to side, right? It looks like it's in motion. If I was to go filter Gaussian blur, that's Gaussian blur. So it just looks like it's blurred, right? Like it's farther into the distance or like it's just out of focus. It's a bit different, a bit different. Even if you're a hobbyist, you should still kind of have that idea just so it's easier to communicate with people. Oops. Okay, yeah, maybe this one I can just go darker overall. I might actually want to change this to slightly closer to blue. Not that heavy though. Mm, there we go. Yeah, the range of like change of saturation and anything. A bit wacky. Oh, I'm working on the wrong layer. Ooh. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Let's fix that then. <laughs> the brush likes so much. <laughs> it does not like working in canvases that are bigger than 4,000 pixels. If people are wondering, my canvas is 4,000 by 7,000 right now. This is a huge 4K piece. That I would have done differently if I was using different um, different materials, but alas, I am not. So, yeah, a Gaussian blur on this element right here. Definitely, but not too certain about everything else. This little like close statue for sure. This needs a Gaussian blur. So that means I'm gonna have to put it into a folder and then copy paste it so then they're merged. Can't work on the wrong layer of all merged. 7,000? Yeah, Lewis. <laughs> My average file size nowadays is usually like. 4,000 by 5,000. That tends to be what I work on most of the time. But my profs always want such small file sizes, so I'm like, I can't... <laughs> I can't work with this! It's so like, you gotta have 8 by 8, 150 DPI. I'm like, that's so small! What do you mean? <laughs> I can't work with this! But on personal work, yeah, I work very, very large. I used to work very, very small. I used to work on, like, like 500 by 600. I've, <laughs> I worked on very, very small files, but now it's like, I, I love big file. Like big as in like physical big. I don't like big file size in terms of like memory, but big in terms of just like physical size. I like that a lot. Yeah, happy face, yeah. Okay, let's merge these two then. Yeah, and then if I were to use the Gaussian Blur on this bad boy. Oh, I need to turn this off first. Yeah, that feels stronger. See? And it gives it a nice kind of sense of depth. Uh, that's what Satinus is talking about. Does an absurd resolution like yours make the piece very large in size? And that's why I sacrifice layer size. Hello, Blood Ryu, welcome in. Jesse exposes professor for thinking small feels bad, man. Oh no, my professors are all incredibly intelligent and far more, far superior to me than I am. <laughs> my profs are all ex extremely talented. I hope to be half as good as them one day. Of course, a lot of them are editorial artists, which is not really where I want to go in terms of, like, oh, not really my area. 
of expertise or my area that I enjoy. So different kinds of artists, but yes, they all, they're all very intelligent people. Sorry, just trying to finesse this a little bit. So I'm trying to make these kind of legible, but still not like the big center of whatever. Okay. Which statue is this? This is statue three? Yeah. Okay. You need some ambient occlusion. Ambient occlusion is something I don't really talk about that much. Ambient occlusion is... Okay, so now I do have to use a... Dang it. I do have to use a multiply layer. It's so annoying. Um, ambient occlusion is... Um, it's your base layers that are... It's your base shadows that are caused by proximity instead of... Um, Oof. they're caused by proximity rather than um, lighting so your ambient occlusion is very very important if you're like drawing a lot of objects together the only issue is that my there's a lot of brush locking with my knife so I can't get exactly what I want No, I had lens flare. No. <laughs> Hello, Art Catron. Welcome in. Um, lens flare is from Michael Bay only. <laughs> Are you satisfied with your drawings and skills? Heck nah. Absolutely not. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Let me tell you a secret. I hate how this looks so far. <laughs> There's so much that I want to do. There's so much that I want to get better at. I'm not, I'm not like, I don't hate all my work currently. There's stuff that I do that I really like. Um, there's, you know, things that I really like that I've done, but, you know, there's so much more that I want to do that I think I could be better at. So I still work at it, you know? Like, I'm not, I'm not about to sit here and go, ah, boohoo, I'm not good enough, I'm just gonna walk away. That's not what I'm gonna do, right? I am, I'm just slowly getting better, you know? As an artist, as an individual... You slowly get better. I think it's foolish to think that you've reached your peak at any point in your life. Oh, I forgot the moss. I was gonna add moss. I'll do that now. Oh, you know what? I'll just do it on a overall file. Kind of like what I had in mind before. Okay. Let me tell you a secret. You'll never be Michael Bay without a lens flare. I don't want to be Michael Bay. Okay. He ruined Transformers, bro. I'm, I don't want to be Michael Bay. <laughs> he wrecked Transformers for me. Absolutely not. I don't know what the heck he was thinking with, um... Oh, what's that one? It was really bad. It was like the, the something night... The Dark Knight. It's not The Dark Knight. It's The Something Knight. But man, that movie was bad. I don't know what he was doing. I don't know what he was thinking. The Dinobots movie. Advertised it with the Dinobots. They showed up for like five minutes. Bro, not epic. False advertising. I felt cheated. I still feel cheated. It's been years. I still feel cheated. <laughs> hey, spring loaded, bro. Spring loaded. For those of you who are unaware of what that means, we had a secret stream the other day um, after Halloween. So that's another incentive for you to join the Discord. Sometimes we have secret streams. They're very rare. 
So if you ever want to get notified of them, you got to join the Discord. <laughs> We had an inside joke about um, we drew a lot of gremlins, or I drew a lot of gremlins, and we kept on making the joke that they were spring loaded. It looked like they were ready to pounce. <laughs> that was a good time. It was a fun time. <laughs> spring loaded, dude. Spring loaded. We stand Pacific Rim anyway. Pacific Rim, I can forgive because he enlisted the help of Guillermo del Toro. Guillermo del Toro is the real king here. If it was just Michael Bay, it wouldn't have happened. We spring loaded today. Let's go. Yeah, let's go, dude. I'm not spring loaded, but I'm I vibe with all of you who are spring loaded. Moss is the way to go. Only do art crimes. That too. <laughs> Pacific Rim is one of the greatest movies ever made. Change my mind. I think Pacific Rim is all right. It wasn't like my favorite, favorite movie. I think it was pretty good, but it wasn't like my favorite, favorite thing ever, you know? We don't talk about Pacific Rim 2, that movie doesn't exist. That's valid. Yeah. It's kind of similar to how we don't really talk about the newer Godzilla movies. <laughs> There's just something about big clunky robots fighting big monsters that come from the ocean. That's valid. That's very valid. I find that those movies all tend to be the same for me, so they don't really do it for me. But I, I definitely see the appeal. I, <laughs> as somebody who used to be a very heavy Transformers stan, I, I definitely see the appeal. <laughs> Tune in late, what are you my drawing? So... We learned about the element of design proportion. So uh, the thing that won the poll was a big abandoned valley. Um, so all I have right now are just really big statues. I don't really have anything like crazy, crazy going on as of right now. Um, but I'm going to add Kirby in so we can see that value difference. Oops. Or we can see the proportional difference, because Kirby's going to be very, very tiny. So what I'm going to do after I do all this is I'm going to do one final merge of everything, and I'm going to add some extra detailing on top of everything, because right now everything feels very, very... like... Somewhat 2D. Oops. Yeah, short version Kirby with stuff, basically. <laughs> so Kirby's only going to be about that big. Um, I'm actually going to make him smaller. Kirby's only going to be about that big. So we can get that proportional difference. This is exaggerated, a bit of exaggerated proportion. This is something that a lot of concept artists do. Very, very heavy proportional difference. Oops.
actually, this should be a bit of a deeper shadow like that. Yeah, that feels better. And then... It'll be blue on the outside of it more. This actually needs to be a little bit less intense. This needs to be a bit duller. Sorry, I'm thinking very hard for this one. <laughs> Obviously, I try to do the best I can for streams. Like, I try to do the best work that I can, given with the tools that I've been given and the tools that I have to use. Um, more often than not, though, I end up dissatisfied with what I create, you know? Again, I am my worst critic. I am super harsh on myself. So, like, it probably looks, like, okay to a lot of people. But to me, I'm like, man, this sucks. <laughs> I'm like, man... I could have done a lot better on this one. That's always my first thought. I shouldn't zoom in too much. Yeah, I'm really trying to think for this one. So it's going to be bounce light because of the heavy amounts of green. I need to make sure that I'm showing off the different forms that Kirby has, which are like three spheres. <laughs> Josie needs to get her fix with Kirby. The cursor isn't enough anymore. Are you kidding me? Do you know how much Kirby stuff I have? I was playing Kirby all morning. I hope you know that. <laughs> I realized that, well, after I played Animal Crossing, I went on to Kirby because, like, I realized that, like, I have, you know, I have a Nintendo online account, so I have access to all these, like, the whole, like, SNES library. Like, not the whole thing, but, like, a very large chunk of the SNES library. And I was like, Ayo, that means that I can play some older Kirby games. I was like, I had been playing, like, like, what was it? Kirby's Kirby Superstar from the 90s. I'd been playing um, Kirby's uh, Adventure 3. Kirby's Dream Land 3, which is, again, I think from the 90s. When I see drawings with no lines in my mind. Lines. Oh, no. I, I love line art. I'm a very heavy line art person, but lineless there's something so fun about it there's something so intensely fun about it um it's a really great challenge it's a really great exercise to work lineless because then you're forced to work with um value difference compared to relying on line work to show off your different forms So if you haven't worked with just color before, no, like, with, like, if you only work with just color, no line work, or if you only work with no, yeah, with, with color and line work, I highly recommend that you try working with um, just color. It's a great exercise because line work can only save you for so long, <laughs> you know? Rim lighting. Rim lighting is always the way to go if you don't know what to do. There we go. tough to do. Um, tough to do move layers on many things sometimes. 
Only sometimes. No, that doesn't match the perspective. We need to match the perspective when our, with our shadows. When we work with anything that's, you know, in some kind of perspective, we need to make sure that we're matching it all throughout the entire piece. That's shadows. That's clouds. That's the elements that are around you. That's the characters. You need to make sure that at the very least, it's approximate, right? It doesn't need to be perfect, perfect. It's just got to be mostly approximate, you know? I did say, I, I said like maybe 20 minutes ago that I hated this. I do like the way that Kirby looks. <laughs> He's so simple. He's so simple to work with. That's the only reason why I like it. Because it's like, it's literally just shading a circle. It's not that hard. I never played Kirby. Any suggestions of which ones I should start with? Um, any. It literally doesn't matter. It's <laughs> um, I love Kirby. My favorite is Superstar Ultra on the Nintendo DS. Um came out in around 2000 oh no 2009 ish i think just around that era so it's it's fairly it's fairly aged by this point oh my god it really doesn't like saving there we go Make them a little bit larger. Yeah, that feels a bit better. Feels slightly more correct. Just slightly. All right. Now we can fix up the... Hello, Paula. Welcome in. And Nathan. Sketch is always looking better than the final art. I don't know why. Ah, uh, I can explain that for you. It's part of uh, just all theory. Let me pull out my notes. Give me a moment. If you thought that the elements of art and the principles of design were it, there's another one that's very university heavy. So we're probably not going to teach it on the channel, but it's called Gestalt Theory. It's a third one. Um, ch -ch -ch -ch. Student similarity is a continuation. Closure, copy. So, technically, you could say that this one is um, why the sketch look better is something called closure. Um, what closure does is it approximates, um, based on pa on previous knowledge, it approximates what the correct thing should be, right? So, a lot of the time when you see closure, it's like you know those vector drawings where it's like they, there's no line work and sometimes a part of the illustration is the same color as the background but your brain automatically knows that's like a shirt or it's like a body or something and um that's closure it's like using past um experience to understand what's supposed to be there um so that's pretty much what's happening all right hang on let's add some light um so that's pretty much what's happening with your with your artwork. When it does that. When it when it looks better in one area than another. Should I make this hard light? Yeah, that looks better. Give it that real nice intense Nintendo <laughs> Nintendo con concept art look. Should I change the color of it? Should I make it blue? You know what? I like the yellow a little bit more. It gives it a bit of warmth. Creates a kind of 
it adds that, it makes it a tetradic color scheme instead of just a triadic. So it gives it that little, little extra bump, you know, it gives it that little extra, little extra something. It makes absolutely no sense to the people who don't know what I'm talking about. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Now we can do some fix-ups. And now we can work on a slightly zoomed in on a smaller scale. Oopsies. I'm on the wrong tool. So now the edges don't have to feel so harsh. Kind of blend stuff in again. It's the subtle things that make your piece look a little bit better. It's like really, really subtle, but it gives your piece just that extra bit of something. And it helps a lot. Give it a, maybe that little extra bit of texture or a little extra bit of, um, a little bit of extra form or whatever, right? Maybe a different lighting. There's little things that you can always do to your artwork to make it appear a lot nicer. I, I used to say a lot, digital art is like 95% final touches. It's like, you can do the base art just fine, but as you get more into digital work, you'll notice that like a lot of it is final touches, which make it look 20 times better. I was a bit late, that's okay. Is your cursor the shape of a Kirby? I just realized, yes it is. Let me just move it up here. And like, um, it is a Kirby, um, but only the people on Discord have seen that it, it moves, he walks. It's not just the single frame. It's just because OBS doesn't capture the animation for some reason. Um, but yeah, it's a Kirby. <laughs> intense. I've never thought of a Nintendo Intense. It really isn't, but the, their concept art very much is. Nintendo's concept art is some of the most, like, it's so beautiful. It's so lively, but man, it's intense. <laughs> it's like you look at it and you're like, woof, that stylization killer to die for. I love it. I'm oh, sorry, to, uh, to D word for. It's beautiful. I have quite a few art books. I have like... I really want Kirby's art book. I haven't purchased it yet. It's not that much, actually. It's like 40 bucks, so it's like not that bad. Um, I will eventually. I'll definitely get that art book at some point. Um, but I don't have it right now. Um, but I know quite a bit of history about Kirby, so it's like... I just want the art book so I can reread the history that I probably already know. <laughs> Kirby straight up eats people. How is that not intense? That, that's very true. Every time I sketches, it's better than the final art. Yeah, it's because your brain approximates what the perfect thing is. And then once you actually line it, you create what your what the actual final thing looks like. And you're like, man, that's not what I was thinking of at all. And it's because your closure wasn't exactly what you envisioned, you know? Make sure that you're constantly turning off your sketch layer as well. Turn off your sketch layer, turn it back on. Um, that helps a lot because if you're constantly staring at your sketch layer and then you turn it off suddenly, you'll go like, wow, that's terrible. Because <laughs> you'll never see what it looks like without the sketch. Um, so that's one thing that you want to do. Um, try not to be overly careful with your line work. That's a big one. A lot of the times people tend to get very, very nervous when they're lining. Don't do that. It, it ruins your line work. It really does. I found that like when people let go a little bit, like they don't care quite as much. If you have an idea in mind and you just go, okay, let's go for it. It, it looks 20 times better. If you're just sitting there like, oh my God, I'm going to mess up. Right? It's going to look bad. It just will. Half of it is psychological. It really is. Right? Art is a very psychological thing. So like, if you have already, if you're already going in with the mindset of, oh my god, it's going to look terrible, it will turn out terrible. You're your own prophet. You're a self-fulfilling prophecy. Currently what I'm doing is I'm just kind of fixing up everything. I'm just kind of making it all feel a bit more coherent. I'm actually going to blur the edges of Kirby a little bit. 
make them a little bit less perfect because currently they feel too harsh. So what I'm going to do is just kind of make them feel a little bit more blurred. Make his edges just feel a bit softer, almost as if I was drawing with a soft brush, but I'm not. This way he feels more unified with the composition that is surrounding him. Oh, he needs a bit of extra light on top of him too, actually. Uh, airbrush. Let's airbrush that bad boy. Yeah. That feels a bit better. So then it's a bit softer on that side. Yeah, subtle things. Look at that, right? It's very, very small things that can really help bump up your art a little bit better, make it feel a little bit more complete. I kind of want to fix the sky too, but I'm like, to what? <laughs> what do I do? I am a little bit unhappy with how the clouds are, so I'll probably just airbrush that in. I hate using the airbrush. The airbrush on Medibank is not great. Um, overall, I just dislike using the airbrush. I feel like it doesn't... It gives... It makes your textures a bit too soft for me. Um, but sometimes, like, I need that textural softness. Or else it doesn't feel correct. So... One thing that universities actually taught me to prioritize is texture. I never really did before, but now it's like texture is half the thing I think about. It's like, okay, how can I make this feel more interesting? Ah, textural difference. Because that was a lot of feedback that I got on my work. It was like, your work is beautiful, but you need more texture. And I was like, I, I'd never thought about texture that much. <laughs> texture is something I never really thought of much. And then like, now it's like they've pointed it out. I'm like, oh yeah, you're correct. I, I don't use texture that much. So it's like all the time, whenever I'd hand something, it's like, this is beautiful, but you could really use more texture. And I'd go like... Yeah, you know what? You're right. <laughs> oh, let's go back here. My guy is keeping no meals. Yeah. Lisa's also very correct. If you end up hating your line art, even though you start skipping line art entirely, it's simply erasing free drawing. Yep, that's also very true. I think I'm a bit harsh to myself. I literally turn off my device and something don't meet my expectations. Ah, yeah, that's a bit intense. You may want to get over that. <laughs> that's a bit intense. Also the reason why Jesse skipped lens flare. Yes, I did. Lens flare only works if there's like a, 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 a bright source of light right there. It needs to be harsh enough. This side, this is a very like area kind of lighting. It doesn't work for this piece. Um, currently drawing while listening to your live stream in the background. It's a good time. I'm glad it is. Sometimes abandoned art pieces just because I get stuck on how to draw part of it. Here's, okay, I'll, I'll talk a bit about that. Let me continue reading the chat. I thought you just named that layer fixed. Yeah. <laughs> I'm funny. I usually just don't do it because it's like better to have something messy and nothing at all since you've always polished with layers on the base. If I can't render, I simply merge everything. Go insane. It usually works out. That's okay, Riley. You don't need to digitally draw. Feel free to just listen in and glad you could make it. Oh, there's only seven minutes left. I'm almost done this piece anyway. Um, yeah, Lisa makes a good point. If you, here's the thing about abandoning pieces right abandoning pieces is totally fine if it's personal work but don't make it a habit that's the thing is that sometimes people are like oh it's totally okay to abandon pieces but then people end up abandoning all their pieces that's not good <laughs> if you suddenly start to get the mindset of i don't like it i'm gonna stop you're gonna find it very difficult to actually finish pieces when you need to um and then when you actually do finish a piece you may find that you hate it like all the time right that's not good either sometimes it's just you gotta you gotta do it right sometimes it's just you gotta do it whether you like it or not um and it's annoying to a lot of people when they hear that but like honestly it's the truth right sometimes it's like I, like there's a lot of pieces i wish i could abandon as well right but there's i sometimes i just don't right if it's a personal work it's if it's personal work you know less important right? Don't need to worry about it too much, right? There's no deadline you need to meet. There's nobody you need to appease, right? That doesn't matter as much. But if you start to abandon every single thing that you do, then it's like, you're setting yourself up for a terrible art concept. That's basically what, <laughs> that's basically what I'm trying to say. Like, I'm not trying to harp on you and go like, oh, if you're like, you never, if you don't finish any of your pieces, you're weak, right? That's not true, right? I've abandoned a lot of things, 
right? But sometimes it's like, even if I don't like where it's going, I'll finish it, stick it out until the end, and then I'll say, okay, I can learn from that next time. It's better to treat your failures as a learning experience compared to completely abandoning it because you didn't get it perfect. When I despise a piece, it's because I'm usually overcomplicating process. What happens is the only thing I can do is merge all layers and rough it out. That's literally all, that's what I do all the time. I merge everything at the end. Usually my, this is not my normal painting process. People on stream know this. <laughs> Usually what my painting process is, is I'll have three layers, I merge them all, and I paint that. That's what it always is. People on stream can confirm, <laughs> right? It's like, you gotta find a process that works for you. If you overcomplicate it, then like, why would you overcomplicate it in the first place? You know, that, that maybe it may work if you're working in a very non-destructive way. But if you're like working on a piece, it's personal. Don't, don't think about it. I'm a very non-thinky person when it comes to art. A lot of my artwork, I don't really think too hard about it. I just do what I think looks kind of good. And then I roll with it, you know. And then I experiment in the, in the process, right? Stuff like that. Have fun with it. The hobbyists can abandon everything for as long as they wish. That's true. But you are also setting yourself up, I guess. It's it's gonna... It, if you draw just to abandon, it, you're not drawing. You're, <laughs> you're just like, you know, whatever. Layer merging save lives. Oh, I, I rarely lay, layer merge. It makes me so mad. That's why I just... I merge only when I paint. Or if, like, I need to add an effect on top of everything. That doesn't work if they're all separate. I work with my layers very strategically in order to have the least amount of layers possible and to also make sure that I merge as little as possible. I do the opposite of what you're supposed to do with digital art all the time. Uh, if there's anyone out there struggling with posing with people, I got a wooden art dummy that helps a lot. Wooden art dummies are great for perspective, not so much for posing. I find if you're working with like 3D, like perspective, if you're just struggling with that foreshortening, wooden art dolls are like the best thing ever because you get that perfect perspective. But their posing is extremely stiff. I mean, extremely stiff. It's not realistic at all. So for perspective, 100%. Posing, not 100%. I'd actually recommend that you get a 3D model. Um, 3D marker doll. Some people use SketchUp. That's one that they really love. Um, Clip Studio has a function in there where you can get 3D models and pose them. Right? That's another great one. I'm being a bit of an elitist today, but that's what you get for getting me in a... In a weird mood. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> anyway. To make sure not to get jealous with awesome art and Pinterest. God, I hate Pinterest. Anyway. <laughs> Pinterest, I have a very love-hate relationship with. Pinterest is great because I'm an artist. And Pinterest sucks because I'm an artist. Because Pinterest loves to be, loves to steal stuff. But Pinterest has the best art references ever. Yeah, I'm just doing kind of like mini refinements now. It's about two minutes left. I'm just kind of doing mini sort of refinements to make things just feel a little bit nicer. Just a smidge. I'm just kind of fixing things up just a little bit. Yeah, also stock model sites. Um, a lot of people use um, Croquis Cafe. Um, oh, I don't remember the site that I use, uh, that I really love. It's great for gestural drawings. I'll post it in the Discord if I ever find it. Um, uh, but that's a great one too. But what if I draw to commit crimes? People do that all the time. That's just called the artist. That's just called being an artist. We do nothing but crimes, our cat draws. It's just what it, that's just what it is. I'm going to try to do the no line thing for this month's challenge. Go for it. Have fun with it. The hobbyist laughs at the overthinking elitist. Some hobbyists overthink as well. Yeah, just kind of blurring that line a bit makes it a little bit less harsh kind of fades it into the perspective a little bit better
I found that like actually streaming my work and having to explain my process helps me with my work overall because it's like it gives me a rationale for what I'm doing. It also gives me that rationale for future pieces as well. It's like techniques that I didn't really think about before because when I started to understand what I was doing, my work got a lot better suddenly. <laughs> I remember talking to a uh, my college professor, like when I when I went for my first year of uh, college, um, he had less teaching experience than I did. So he was talking with us and he went like, I re I noticed that like my work suddenly start started getting better when I started teaching. And I'm like, that's because you're noticing things. <laughs> it's kind of like giving yourself a review of the basics, like involuntarily. And what that does is it kind of helps you figure stuff out. So it's it's always good to kind of know what you're doing. Even if, like, I, again, I work a very brain empty kind of way, but, like, the, it's always good to kind of know what you're doing as well. No lines challenge sounds fun. So true. Looking on Pinterest is always something random. Yeah, that's so true. It's like I'm looking up dressing poop as a fire hydrant. So true. I remember looking at poses once, and then there was, like, oh, what was there? There was, like, it was, like, a bunch of people. It's like I was looking up poses for like, I was looking up back muscles. That's what I was looking up. And then I saw like a smoothie recipe. I was like, what are you doing here? That's not <laughs> I'm trying to look up back muscles. We're contributing to the process. So true. So true. Okay. You know what? Actually, when I finish this, it's not too bad. I'm actually all right with it. Let me just manually blur this a little bit. Just a little bit. To give it a bit more of a false blur because i don't want a legit blur for these guys i just want it to be a little bit hazy not quite a blur though i want them to look like i roughly drew them in there not just you know <laughs> heavily put it on there i was me with with sushi that's valid fatima fatima how do you pronounce that name because i've had quite a few friends named um fatima and fatima and they pronounce it in two different ways so <laughs> anyway the best way to know if you've truly learned something is to try to teach it to someone else. Very true. I have studied for assignments by teaching the same concepts to my students. So, you know. All right, though, everyone. Um, that's going to do it for this week's stream. This one was a lot of fun, actually. Thanks so, so much for joining. Um, what are we doing next week? What is next week? I believe it's a manga panel redraw. Let's see. My channel. Yes, it's a it's a manga panel redraw. So we're gonna be doing that next week. It's gonna be a non a non lecture stream. So we're just gonna be drawing a manga panel. Um, I'll put up which ones I want to redraw. Um, but yeah, thanks. So both work excellent. Um, but yeah, thanks so so much for joining everyone. Um, again, if you don't know too much about the channel, if you're new over here, then make sure you check out. Um. Oh, sorry. Yeah, if you're new to the channel, you don't know too much about us. We're not just a YouTube channel. We're an art school. Haha. <laughs> so if you'd like to check out the classes that we offer, be sure to check them out on our website um, for all of our class offerings. I am one of the instructors. Sometimes our other instructors pop into the chat, um, but sometimes they don't. That's totally okay, too. Um, so they weren't here today. But um, if you would like to check out the class that we offer, winter camps are coming up. So if you'd like to get proper lessons from me, <laughs> um, feel free to join us then. Um, this piece that you see in front of you, including the lesson, both of them will be available as, available as JPEGs on our Discord. If you'd like to join the Discord, links are going to be popping up soon. Um, so if you'd like to check out the Discord, join us, talk with us. Sometimes we hold secret streams so that you can turn on your mic and actually talk to me. Um, feel free to join our Discord for that. Instagram also lets you know when we're streaming. So if you'd like to join that, um, also let us know. Um, and... But there's a lot of there's a lot of layers in this file for once. There's never usually that many layers, but this one has a crap ton of layers. <laughs> so if you'd like to see my working files, be sure to check out our Patreon for as little as five dollars a month. You can get all my working files and the um oh my god. All my working files and behind the scenes content for Wayne Canvas, stuff that happens at the studio with all of our other um lovely staff members and um co-op students so if you'd like to check those out um or if you just want to support the channel that's two dollars a month so if you'd like to check out any of that uh feel free to do so before any of the spots are gone 
Um, but yeah, guys, thanks so, so much for joining. I had a real, I actually had a lot of fun doing this one. This one is, I, I usually use a lot of like multiply layers. And <laughs> I think I only use one special layer. Yeah, the lighting with hard light. It was a hard light layer. Everything else is just a normal layer. Feels great. I don't usually do that. <laughs> um, so this is a really great exercise for me. Um, but yeah, thanks so, so much for joining y'all. I'll see y'all next week. Bye-bye.